Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Hey yo, I watched the Hello There Guy show. It was okay. Contrary to what a lot of people are saying, this isn't the worst Star Wars product out there. Hell, it's not even the worst Star Wars product this year. And it does have a good amount of things going for it. But at the same time, it's also plagued with some truly incomprehensible writing, directorial, and editing decisions, to the point where it's really hard to get fully immersed in the show. I'm also just sick of people talking about it in general, because everyone's opinion of it seems to be either vitriolic hatred or unwarranted total praise. So I'm happy to provide a perspective that considers both the good and the bad, ultimately coming to the conclusion that... Yeah, it was mid. Kinda reminds me of another Star Wars product, actually. Oh yeah, one more thing, this is gonna be a full spoiler discussion. I assume everyone who's watching this has either seen the show or doesn't care about spoilers. So yep, spoilers ahoy! I feel like the easiest point of praise with this show is the performances. Owen McGregor is as good as ever as Obi-Wan, and he's a much more charismatic and compelling protagonist than Tamora Morrison was in the Book of Boba Fett. You can really feel just how tortured and frightened he is through his facial expressions, and he once again gets to showcase just how well cast he was in this part. I also really like the small bits of Hayden Christensen as Anakin we got via the flashbacks in Episode 5. He feels like a mixture of prequels and Clone Wars Anakin, and it's nice to see Hayden bridge that gap through his performance. I really would have loved to see more of him in the show. He's a really fine actor who is also well cast and just brought down by George Lucas' lack of focus on the actors during his direction. Hayden was also great as Vader, but we'll get to that later. Moses Ingram gives a solid performance as Reva. Is it pronounced Reva? I should have checked. Okay, I just spent the past five minutes checking if it was Reva or Reva, and how you pronounce it. Uh, apparently it's Reva. This character has a lot of problems, but they all tie back to the writing. I think the performance itself was perfectly fine. Obviously, you're a shithead if you attack the actress because you didn't like her character, and you're doubly a shithead if your main motivation was racism. Didn't think that needed to be said, but here we are. Vivian Lyra Blair gives a pretty good child performance as Leia. I would describe her performance as lovably annoying, which is perfect for a precocious 10-year-old. She's totally in line with the Leia we know from A New Hope, and the kid has a really good rapport with Ewan McGregor. I really liked Kumail Nanjiani's character. I thought the comedic performance actually worked, but I also kind of wish they didn't bring him back after episode 2. He probably would have been way more effective as a once-and-done character. And surprisingly enough, I really enjoyed Joel Edgerton's portrayal of Owen Lars, especially in the final episode. This is a character I've never given a shit about, but I think the actor did a really good job of channeling the gruffness Owen had in A New Hope. He didn't get much to do at all in the prequels, but I think here he gets to cement the fact that he was also perfectly cast way back when. So yeah, good actors doing their best. But unfortunately, their performances are brought down by the direction and the writing. Let's talk about the direction first, because this is truly the most baffling part of the show. I know Deborah Chow is a capable director. I remember being blown away by the action scene in the third episode of Mandalorian that she helmed. She's directed a lot of high-profile stuff in the past, even an episode of Better Call Saul, which is a good show that I like. I know she's capable of really gripping stuff, which is why some of the shit this show presents you with visually is just... Huh? Everyone's already ragged on the embarrassing chase scene with Leia and the bounty hunters in episode 1, Reva's awkward parkour in episode 2, Vader somehow getting blocked by some fire even though he already showed he could douse fire in episode 3, the ridiculous trench coat scene in episode 4, the ridiculous barely hidden officer Tala took out in episode 4, the ridiculous everything else that happened in episode 4, pretty much. And yeah, I have no defense for any of this. This sort of stuff is frankly absurd, and it happens often enough to be really distracting. If it was just one or two silly scenes, and then the rest of the direction was incredibly strong, then it'd be easy enough to overlook. But the stuff in this show that visually and logistically makes no sense just keeps coming, to the point where these episodes start to feel less like they were directed by a human, and more like they were directed by an algorithm. Something that captures the feeling of human direction impressively well, but has just enough awkward and nonsensical mistakes to remind you that, oh yeah, an AI made this. Obviously, I don't think that's actually the case yet, but what I do think happened was Disney wanting to rush this series out the door as soon as possible, and not giving Deborah Chow enough time to second-guess herself regarding how awful some of these scenes looked. 
There are a lot of scenes where her talent really shines through, particularly most of the Vader scenes, which we'll talk about later. She still manages to prove that she can direct really well in this show, but I don't think she had enough time to properly plan out every scene and make it all look good. I see no reason why some of the other Mandalorian directors couldn't have stepped in to help with some of these episodes. I think the show as a whole would have turned out a lot better for it. I also want to talk about the cinematography and editing, which are kinda whack. There's a lot of weird cuts during dialogue scenes that don't make a lot of sense and take me out of what's happening. And the amount of shaky cam, particularly in episode 5, is just super disorienting. I saw people on Twitter going on and on about how this episode was Deborah Chow's masterpiece, and how it was so phenomenal, and like, I'm glad the cut of the episode that you guys watched was visually comprehensible, but I could not for the life of me make out any of the action when the stormtroopers were chasing everyone down. And between the shaky cam and the awkward way Obi-Wan shouting her name was edited, Tala's death scene just came across as super goofy. Not really something you want to be saying about a major death scene, but I'm sorry, I really can't help how it felt to me. Oh god, now we have to talk about the writing. I cannot express enough how much I would rather talk about anything else than some of the baffling writing choices on this show. In fact, just to prove it to you all, I'm literally going to spend the next minute and a half or so talking about Squarespace and what a great tool it is to make websites, because I would legitimately prefer to do so than talk about some of the writing decisions in the Obi-Wan show. So let's do that right now. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive, online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password-protected pages to share private works with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile presence that matches the overall style of your website, so your content will look great on every device, every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is so simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains, so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, .org, or or you can always get a more specific one like .art if you want to be fancy. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, so the writing. Obviously, the best parts of this show were the confrontations between Obi-Wan and Vader. And I feel like conceptually, that is the ideal story to tell with Obi-Wan during this time period. But that's why I found it kind of disappointing how sparsely the show actually focused on their interactions. They obviously had to do a lot of tiptoeing around the established canon to make the story work. Like, Vader can't know Obi-Wan is on Tatooine, so we gotta get him off the planet. Well, Obi-Wan having to go rescue Leia is a sensible enough driving force for the story, sure. But Vader also can't really have any interactions with Leia, so we have to introduce a whole new antagonist to get the story going. Reva and Leia serve their purposes to the plot well enough but I felt like they took too much focus away from the namesake character of the show. This would have been so much better as a committed, compelling character study of Obi-Wan and his fallen relationship with Anakin. It's one of those rare instances where more fanservice-y flashbacks to the events of the Clone Wars would have been welcome. The practice duel the two of them had prior to Attack of the Clones was a nice touch when contrasted with the present, but by episode 5 out of 6, it feels like too little, too late. There's so much more of the past between these two that they could have shown in order to really heighten the dramatic confrontations these two are having now. And I just find Reva's inclusion in the show as one of the primary drivers of the narrative to be such an odd decision. On paper, her story arc is really neat. A youngling who survived Order 66 and now wants revenge on Vader, working her way up to be his right-hand Inquisitor, all in an effort to betray him while he's focused on Kenobi. That's a great idea for a character, but... I feel like there's a lot of aspects about her that just don't add up. Like, she's super aggravated towards Kenobi for not being there to stop Anakin from turning, even though it's not really his fault. And yeah, I guess that's the point. Vader straight up tells Obi-Wan in the last episode that he's not the one who failed Anakin, and Obi-Wan needs to accept that. But that doesn't stop Reva's where were you when Anakin was killing younglings question from not really holding much dramatic weight. 
Obi-Wan was riding a big lizard and fighting a funny skeleton man in order to end the war that Palpatine manipulated everyone into fighting. Not only does Reva's supposedly dramatic question evoke memories of what was ultimately a pretty silly battle, but it feels like her anger towards Obi-Wan is super misplaced and kind of a leap in logic. If there's a secondary person she should be this angry at after Vader, shouldn't it be Palpatine? The guy who invented Order 66? I don't know, her seething resentment of Obi-Wan just feels kind of forced and only in there because this is the Obi-Wan show, so we need another villain who also hates Obi-Wan besides Vader since he can't drive every plot point in the show because of pre-established canon. Oh yeah, and Reva and the Grand Inquisitor surviving getting stabbed is kinda silly. Yeah, I get it, Sith are prone to use revenge to cling on to life and Vader and Maul have survived worse, I got that. And I guess later on Palpatine does too, cool. But if Reva survived getting stabbed as a child because of her thirst for revenge, why does she think doing the same thing to the Inquisitor won't result in him also surviving? Why not just cut his head off? And how is she the only one of these younglings that survived due to a thirst for revenge? I guess I can buy Vader and the Inquisitor leaving her for not dead in episode 5 since they know she can't do anything to stop them, but if her desire for revenge is what's keeping her alive, then what happens in episode 6 when she doesn't want revenge anymore? How come she doesn't just die once she turns not evil? She really should have gone to a space hospital to get that wound checked out, and and then went to Tatooine to get her revenge against Luke for some reason? Oh my god, don't even get me started on the dumbest shit I've ever seen anyone do in Star Wars. Hey Obi-Wan, it's me, known Galactic Senator Bail Organa. I haven't heard from you, which could mean that you're captured or dead. But just in case you're just leaving me on red, I just wanted to let you know that I am going to Tatooine, Tatooine to check on Owen, Owen, to help him with the very important boy that needs to be taken care of. It's a good thing I said all of those important keywords instead of encrypting my message or being vague, and it's a good that Kumail accidentally dropped this message right in the sand where Reva lay dying or else Reva couldn't have gotten this message and gone back to Tatooine to kill the boy for some inexplicable reason. And also, it's a good thing that out of all the people she could have talked to on Tatooine in episode 1, it just so happened to be Owen so she knows exactly who this message is talking about. That's a relief. Whoa. Yeah, I seriously dare you to come up with a defense for that. I f***ing dare you. Ultimately, I think the conclusion to Reva's arc in episode 6 was really nice in a vacuum, but the amount of stupid bullshit it took to get there, from a staff Establishing that lightsaber wounds don't matter for dark side users, to Bale's idiotic hologram message that I'm shocked more people don't take issue with. I almost wish they didn't even bother trying to redeem Reva and that she just died in episode 5. Again, a cool character conceptually and the performance is fine, but the execution just didn't land in a lot of ways unfortunately. Anyway, there's one last negative point I'd like to discuss before I finally talk more about what I liked about this show. And that negative is the entirety of episode 4. Just all of it. Prior to this one, I didn't hate any of the episodes. Episode 1 is kinda stilted and a bit boring, but outside of the Leia chase scene, nothing was awful. Episode 2 was pretty decent with a cool new planet, fun character moments, and cute Obi-Wan and Leia banter. And Episode 3 was kinda good actually. Freck was epic, there was solid emotion, and the Vader stuff? we will get to. The show looked like it was on track to just get better and better and turn out pretty good despite its slow start. And then episode 4 just trampled all over my hopes and dreams. When you only have 6 episodes to tell a story, one of them being bad is a huge detriment to the entire package. And it's not like this episode derailed the entire narrative or anything, but it just felt empty, aimless, pointless. Nothing of value was added to the story. It's literally just, oh no, Leia is kidnapped. Again! Let's go save her! Again! Not only a retread of A New Hope, it's a retread of episode 2 of this show. There was no reason to do this. I assumed Leia had served her purpose to the story of getting Obi-Wan out of hiding and back into Vader's orbit, but nope! We gotta spend yet another episode rescuing her. And since she can't meet Vader yet, we gotta have Reva be the main villain of this episode. O okay, I, I get what you're doing, so this will be like the episode where we finally learn Reva's backstory. Maybe either via flashbacks or her telling it to Leia. Nope! We get no new insight on Reva or any of the other characters, really. Gotta save that for episode 5 out of 6 for some reason. Oh, well clearly this episode's gonna have a dramatic death scene, like there's no way Tala's making it out of here alive, especially after Reva catches her. Nope! She survives this mission perfectly fine and then just 
dies in the middle of the next episode. Why? What was the point of any of this? This episode could have had some meaning if it had a dramatic sacrifice, and then Tala's robot still could have been the sacrifice in episode 5. Fundamentally, nothing about that episode would change, and this episode would actually push at least one of the characters' stories forward. Oh. Excuse me, I spoke too soon. We do get the dramatic sacrifice of Wade, a character we meet in this episode with four whole lines of dialogue. One at the beginning and three at the end before he's unceremoniously killed off. I genuinely could not believe what I was seeing. This was the emotional peak of the episode, the laughable death of a non-character, an empty void of storytelling. As Wade died, I felt a piece of myself die, knowing that the story I had been following for the past three weeks, featuring the return of an actor-character combination I had wanted to see again for over a decade, had no interest in consistently meaningful emotional stakes or compelling writing. Star Wars has proven itself to be capable of so much more, especially when it comes to rescue mission stories. Many have pointed to the delightful bickering between Luke and Han as their plan to rescue Leia slowly fell apart, and noticed that by comparison, Episode 4 of Kenobi lacked any sort of compelling characterization or interactions between our rescuers. While that's an easy and strong point to make, it wasn't the first thing my mind drifted to. There was once this really, really good TV show. You may have heard of it. It's called Star Wars The Clone Wars. There was this one three-part arc where they needed to infiltrate this impenetrable citadel, and they made it feel impenetrable. The heroes had to freeze themselves in carbonite in order to avoid getting detected by lifeform scanners. They had to carefully consider every aspect of their plan and constantly adapt it when things went wrong. Most of the rescue party ended up dying. Hell, one of the people they were trying to rescue ended up dying. It had stakes, it had build-up, it had tension. It was an incredibly well-executed and beautifully realized storyline from a bygone era where the people making Star Wars projects cared about telling good stories first and appeasing their corporate overlords second. If this episode had even a fraction of the ingenuity and tension of the Clone Wars Citadel arc, which also featured the same character of Obi-Wan Kenobi performing a rescue, mind you, then it could have been something really special. But it's not. The only thing that could possibly give this episode any worth is if in a couple years they create yet another piece of fill-in-the-blank storytelling entitled Wade, A Star Wars Story, showing what an amazing character Wade was and retroactively fixing his tensionless death. I am so tired, I just want this video to end now. But unfortunately, I promised I'd talk about the good stuff that I like in this show, so I guess we gotta do that now. Essentially, all of my highest praise for this series boils down to one character. And that character is Darth Vader. Yes, it was silly how he let Obi-Wan get away in Episode 3, but aside from that one moment, they did my boy so right in this series. I feel like he's one of very few characters that has come out of Disney Star Wars slightly enhanced, and he's the primary reason why Episode 3, and especially Episode 6, were my favorites of the series. Hell, I didn't like Episode 5 nearly as much as everyone else because of the awful shaky cam, and bizarre editing, and stupid Bail Organa shit, and poorly executed Reva shit. Seriously, if she wanted to wait until Vader was distracted by Kenobi to strike at him, then why did she strike at him when Kenobi wasn't there? How did she expect to win that confrontation? Whatever, in spite of all that, the episode still gave me some cool ass Vader shit. When he effortlessly repels Reva without even pulling out his lightsaber, then takes her saber and breaks half of it off and gives it to her in order to toy with her some more, and then he reveals that he always knew her identity? That is some king shit right there. That's not even mentioning how intensely he ripped apart the ship he thought Obi-Wan was on. Or going back to episode 3, how viciously he burned Obi-Wan alive. I love when a Star Wars villain is petty enough to torture someone in a similar manner to what happened to them. One of the very few things I like about Rise of Skywalker is how Palpatine throws Vader's grandson down a pit as revenge for Vader throwing him down a pit. It's the perfect combination of silly and sinister that fits his character. Not into the pit! It burns! Meanwhile, Vader burning Obi-Wan is an amazing reflection of his unbridled rage and resentment. It's a very well-paced and well-shot moment that feels like it was given the weight it deserved dramatically. Speaking of stuff being given the weight it deserves dramatically, Episode 6. Even in spite of all the baffling creative decisions that plagued the rest of the series, I have to admit that this final episode really did win me over. It felt like the story the show wanted to tell the whole time. 
and from my perspective, it was worth trudging through the mediocrity and occasional awfulness for. The fight delivers a solid amount of spectacle while even subtly referencing the high ground in a pretty clever way. Showing Vader towering over top of Obi-Wan in a pit doesn't feel like a cute fanservice wink, it feels like a clever juxtaposition to the ending of their duel in Revenge of the Sith. At first, I was really worried when Obi-Wan was buried alive and Vader walked away, because that obviously would have been a really stupid way to end things. But thankfully, the fight continued and led into the best scene in the whole show, Vader and Obi-Wan's verbal confrontation. I obviously noticed right away how similar it was to Ahsoka and Vader's confrontation in Rebels, but I don't really see it as a ripoff. More so, a profound version of Star Wars being like poetry, sort of. It rhymes. Ultimately, Obi-Wan's relationship with Anakin was different than Ahsoka's. He believes he inadvertently made Anakin into the monster he sees before him, which I think is even more powerful than Ahsoka regretting the fact that she left Anakin. Because she didn't really. She left the Jedi Order that betrayed her trust, but she and Anakin remained on good terms right before his fall. Obi-Wan and Anakin's relationship took a much more severe hit. And Obi-Wan clearly regrets Anakin's fall even more than Ahsoka does, since it was his job to mentor and guide Anakin. So while this is technically similar to the Ahsoka scene in Rebels, I think it's even more powerful than that already amazing moment. Hearing Obi-Wan tell Anakin he's sorry, and ultimately just calling him Darth, just really got to me. And the eerie mixing of Hayden Christensen and James Earl Jones' voices, as Vader tells Obi-Wan that he killed Anakin, with a horrific smirk on his face as the blue lighting fades to red? Yeah, this was a damn good, well-written, well-directed scene that enhances both of their characters and sets up their final confrontation in A New Hope incredibly well. I was always a bit skeptical about the idea of the two of them meeting again between their duels on Mustafar and the Death Star, but I think the show did a great job at adding something meaningful to the canon between them. Obi-Wan can stop blaming himself for what happened to Anakin, and now it actually feels like less of a stretch when he tells Luke that Vader betrayed and murdered Anakin. It's the certain point of view that Vader himself subscribes to, and it's pretty raw and chilling to hear that from him. Other than that, Reva's arc in this episode was satisfying in spite of the insane leaps the previous episode took to get her here. Obi-Wan and Leia's final scene together was strong. The fact that he said hello there at the end was actually welcome and didn't feel pandery or meme probably because he went out of his way to deliver it like Alec Guinness did. And the Qui-Gon scene at the end was... kinda silly. Like, Obi-Wan's just riding through the desert and he appears suddenly and it just looks goofy to me. But honestly, after the amount of goofy shit this show threw at me, I just kind of accepted it. They could have done his cameo in a more dramatic and substantial way, but at that point I was just happy to see him again, so I didn't care too much. I think it's a cool parallel that Vader and Obi-Wan's final scenes in the show is talking to their masters. Even though Palpatine also looked and sounded a tad off, I don't know, whatever. It was a good episode that finally justified the show's existence. To quote Qui-Gon in this episode, well, took you long enough. I know most of this review has been pretty negative, because, yeah, this show does have a lot of obvious problems in the writing, directing, cinematography, editing, etc. departments. Considering how long people have wanted Ewan McGregor to return as Obi-Wan, I really do wish the show was better. But at the same time, I didn't hate it or anything. The only episode I'd outright call bad was episode 4, and even then, it's not awful. Just an instance of bland filler in a show that really can't afford to have bland filler. The other episodes are watchable enough. I like Obi-Wan's relationship with Leia, some of the side characters are fun and some of the new planets were cool, and ultimately, I think the performances, the stuff they did with Vader, and the final episode in general really carried this show in the end. It was passable, and ultimately better than Book of Boba Fett, but it's also become depressingly clear that this is the new standard for Star Wars shows. The high quality of seasons 1 and 2 of The Mandalorian were clearly just a fluke. Since now Disney's more committed to quantity over quality and are going to keep cranking these things out at a breakneck pace, regardless of their obvious writing and directorial flaws. So whatever, I'm just not going to get excited about new Star Wars stuff anymore, the same way I'm not really excited for new MCU stuff anymore. Also the same way I'm not really excited for new Disney and Pixar movies anymore. I'm just quietly going to accept the oversaturation and rushed mediocrity and move on with my life. 
I'll still watch the stuff I'm mildly interested in for the sake of reviewing it, and I'll get excited whenever a few gems slip in there, like the finale of this show, or the two Boba Fett episodes that didn't have Boba Fett in them. But ultimately, I'm just gonna do what Obi-Wan did, and keep my head low waiting for a new hope to come around and destroy the evil empire that is Disney. So yeah, 6 out of 10, it'd be a 5 if the ending wasn't so good, but yeah. Not the best, not the worst, it could've just been a 2.5 hour movie, I need a nap. Wake me up when Wade, a Star Wars story, comes out. Good night, Tri-State Galaxy.